My name is Chad Hutchins. I'm the head of digital collections at the University of Wyoming, and with me I have Tyler Kerr. Tyler is our coordinator of what's called the Student Innovation Center, which is a makerspace in the libraries that's also a collaborative effort with the College of Engineering and uh, University IT. So we're excited to come talk to you all about this. This is a good turnout and welcome. Uh, we're going to be speaking about 3D scanning and augmented reality as a method to deliver and promote digital collections in libraries and museums, and I guess we should have thrown in archives there for good measure. Um, in this case, this is a collaborative effort between the UW libraries on a number of uh, levels with uh, the University of Wyoming Geological Museum. So uh, this is obviously a paleontology collection that we're talking about, but there's a lot of other applications that we can uh, apply this to. Um, before we jump into this, uh, we have an app that we've developed for this. If you haven't already started to download this, uh, it's available for iOS and Android users. If you just search for Wyo Fossil, that's all one word in the uh, Google Play Store or the Apple Store, you can download it. Hopefully the wireless works out with everybody and it actually can come down. Um, and if those of you uh, who just joined us uh, want, we have the augmented reality cards up here. Uh, a lot of people in the audience already have them, but if you don't have them, please feel free to come up and grab. Uh, we have five different ones up here that we'll be uh, talking about. So, like I said, this is a collaborative effort between a number of places on campus. Uh, my office in the libraries, uh, Tyler's group in the Makerspace and Innovation Center, and we have to make sure that we give Dr. Vietti uh, credit for this. Uh, she's the museum and collections manager at the UW Geological Museum. She came up with a lot of the ideas that we're going to be talking about today, and she funded a good portion of the augmented reality piece of what we've been doing, whereas the libraries have funded a lot of the scanning and the digital storage for some of this, and Tyler has been doing a lot of the other work. Um, so uh, just for a little bit of context, about this. Uh, the Geological Museum is uh, on the west side of campus at the University of Wyoming and it's a fossil vertebrate collection. Uh, many of you have been to museums like this before. Um, there's a public side of it that's on display and there's a back of the house side of it that houses a lot of the content that is not on display to the public. Um, this spans 40,000 specimens, uh, 6,000 species, and across 2,600 localities or locations. And as you might imagine, we have large things like uh, Big Al here, it's an Allosaurus um, skeleton. And then we have a large Apatosaurus that spans the entire length of the museum, um, down to smaller things, which is typically what we've scanned and are offering up through this augmented reality application are smaller things that are, uh, I suppose, a couple of feet in length all the way down to something that's about the size of your thumb but also about 75% of the collection is comprised of these small teeth that are about the size of a pinhead. So there's about three or 30,000 of them that sit in storage that um, very few people actually ever see. So um, we've been working on this project for a number of years uh, and in true project update, I came to CNI in 2017 and talked about how we first got started with this. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about how we scanned these and what the equipment was, but I, I will touch on it a little bit. But two or three years ago, when we first jumped into this, um, we really wanted to just learn how to do 3D imaging. Um, and Tyler was actually one of the students that we hired at the time um, to get us going on all of this, which was great. Tyler has a degree in paleontology, a master's degree from the University of Wyoming. So that's been really helpful for this particular project for obvious reasons. Um, but Dr. Vietti also uh, wants to do a lot of outreach to K through 12. Um, and this is a good way of delivering that without requiring people to come to Laramie, Wyoming, which is in the southeast corner of the state. Um, Wyoming is a big state. Uh, it's a lot of small towns and a lot of distance between things and obviously we get very bad weather uh, for most of the year, um, including probably tomorrow when we're flying back. But uh, at any rate, uh, we also wanted to see if we could legitimately do digital preservation of fossil specimens that sometimes get dropped or destroyed or um, uh, destro uh, are destroyed for uh, research purposes. 
Uh, remote access to hidden collections won't be lost on anybody here. And then also the use of 3D digital models. Uh, open educational resources are a, a pretty big topic now in libraries and across the country in higher education and K through 12. And this is a really good melding of two really interesting um, trends in, in academe right now. So we'll talk about a little bit about that later. So I, I want to touch a little bit on specimen digitization equipment that we use for this particular project. Um, for this one, this was our first foray into this. Um, instead of doing something like photogrammetry, we decided that we would purchase a structured light scanner. Um, in this case, we used a David or HP. HP purchased David a number of years ago, uh, HP SLS scanner. And this is a fairly easy to use scanner in terms of uh, learning curve and whatnot, and it's done a pretty good job for, for what our purposes are. Uh, it's also fairly accessible. It produces really good results uh, in terms of resolution. It's about 4,500 bucks to get into this at first. Um, you also have to have a, a, a machine that's capable of doing 3D um, modeling and manipulation and things of that sort, but it's a, it's a relatively low cost barrier to get into this if that's what you're looking for. Um, we have a lot of documentation about this. I'm not going to go into this right now. If you are so inclined, you can go look at the presentation I did from 2017 and it goes into a lot more detail than I'm going to do today. Um, but suffice it to say, the David scanner is actually pretty uh, a good piece of equipment for, for these purposes. Uh, so I want to touch on where we're at today. Uh, after a couple of years of doing 3D imaging with the Geological Museum. Uh, we run Islandora at UW for our digital collections repository, and that's where we load all of our content. Um, as of uh, today, we have about 600 specimens that we've scanned and are available for download, and you can 3D print these. Uh, we have some of the prints of our specimens here with us today that Tyler got heckled for by the TSA um, uh, for stealing fossil specimens. <laughs> Um, at any rate, uh, these are all available there. Do be aware we're still working on some metadata issues uh, within our repository system, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I want to speak briefly about challenges that we've had with putting these things in a repository system that's not designed for 3D. Um, most of you are pretty aware, uh, more than likely, that most library and archival museum repository systems are not built for 3D yet. We're not, we're just not there. So what we've done is a bit of a kludge, or a, a lot of a kludge, I should say. Um, this is just a brief display of one of, uh, this is a fox uh, skull. But uh, we have the UW specimen number that's assigned at the museum. That's the UW 3480 and the species information. Um, to give users an an idea that this is a 3D model. We just have an animated GIF that spins around when you load this page. Um, and then in the upper right, you'll see a link that is basically a zip archive of all the models that we produce for each specimen. So within that zip archive, we have two different directories. We have a low resolution directory of 3D models, and then we have a higher resolution directory. And then within each one of those directories, we have three popular 3D file formats or most useful 3D file formats for 3D printing, especially um, the STL, PLY, and OBJ files. So these zip packages are fairly large. Um, so we have some challenges with web delivery uh, on this, um, especially when it comes to smart devices. Uh, we don't have an interactive viewer within Islandora right now. So people can't come in and do uh, lighting changes. They can't remove the texture wraps. Um, they can't do measurements or anything like that. They have to go in, down, go to go into Islandora, download that zip archive, unpack it, and then open whatever file they want in a local client application. Which, you know, it's not a huge barrier, but it's certainly not the most user-friendly thing that we could possibly do. But it's what we were able to do with what resources we had, um, and it's still a 2D experience. You know, you're still looking at something on a 2D uh, computer screen. Um, as opposed to all of the two-dimensional uh, content that, that most libraries do, books, newspapers, pamphlets, maps, etc., cetera, um, we're building all of our derivatives by hand instead of using the system to process it. So we're building thumbnails by hand, of the rotating GIF by hand, uh, the low-res 3D files, the high-res 3D files. We're packing the zip archive by hand, and then we put it into Islandora. So it's a time-consuming process. Um, I already mentioned that it's not smart device-friendly 
downloading these big zip archives onto your phone is certainly possible, uh, but maybe not the best thing that you could, the best thing that users want to do. So we've kind of, we were kind of tinkering around with how are we going to get this stuff into people's hands easily? Um, and this is not to disparage repository systems. We, we love repository systems. That's what we do um, in my department. But we wanted to find a different way to get this into people's hands in a, in a much more accessible me, uh, manner um, without incurring the cost of uh, having to buy a virtual reality headset. And Tyler will talk a lot about this. Um, but a lot of what I'm talking about is just the fact that there's there's no there's no content standards right now for 3D content. Um, the good thing is is that there are groups working on this, which is and they're producing some really great things. But uh, when I was talking about what file formats we store, there is no agreed upon file format for 3D content right now or an archival format. So when we settled on STL, OBJ, and PLY, we we did that because that's what most programs are most easily using at this point in time. We could have done something else, but this is where that's what we settled on. Um, a lot of other things that we could work with in terms of metadata is, you know, what do we record? Do, how do we record how we built these models? You know, we all, we know what what software we used, but our repository system's not pulling that in like it does with two dimensional content automatically. Um, like I said, for this, we're using a structured uh, structured light scanner. We do photogrammetry as well. We do RTI capture. Um, we have three different SLS scanners, uh, different models. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do this, but this is we for this particular project we're using structured light scanners. Um, and later this afternoon, the uh, CS3DP people are here and they're doing great work. If you, um, if you're not familiar with it, they're speaking at one. Um, please go see their presentation. They're doing some really awesome things. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Tyler, and he's going to talk about uh, what we were doing and how we developed our augmented reality app. OK. Um, so like Chad said, the university has some really wonderful collections, uh, much of which is being digitized into 3D files right now. Um, and that sort of led us to the next question of, uh, how do we get this digital content into people's hands um, in perhaps the most accessible and easy to manage way? Um, and first and foremost, I thought it'd be helpful to cover the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, so when you put on those VR goggles, um, what you're truly doing is, is fully immersing yourself into a digital world with very little input or output from the real world. Um, and in contrast to that, when you, we talk about augmented reality, it's in the name. It augments the world around you with an overlay of content. Um, and so there's a couple advantages for us. Virtual reality is, is increasingly popular, um, but we see AR as a, a little bit of an, uh, uh, an easier and, and perhaps more appealing, approachable, immediate prospect for presenting this, this 3D data. Um, number one, the, the, uh, the biggest appeal of AR is the cost. Um, there's a low component cost as far as the tech required for augmented reality um, compared to VR. Um, and then to that end, in terms of access, uh, access to the technology that you would require for augmented reality um, is uh, a little bit more accessible um, than the tech required for VR. Um, case in point, there's an order of magnitude more people who have smartphones, both globally and in the US, um, than there are folks who have VR right now. Um, and then lastly, from a technological standpoint, um, a little bit easier to integrate um, AR content uh, into pre-existing um, displays or technology um, and like I said before biggest take-home point here is that um, most folks already own the necessary tech it's in your pocket so um, sort of building off of that and breaking it down a little bit further um, that advantage with AR um, regarding the popularity of it um, is really just how accessible it is right so 34 percent of the world's population as a smartphone, 15% of the world's population is a tablet, and only 2% of the world's population, which is still a sizable amount, um, has a, a VR headset. Um, and another benefit of AR um, is the cost associated with it. Um, so many consumers do already own a smartphone or a tablet um, that can easily run the AR content. Not many people quite yet have uh, the VR uh, technological uh, requirements. Um, that said, if you don't have either and you're looking to get into this stuff, it's about a third of the cost to buy a smartphone um, and a fairly popular smartphone um, as opposed to 
uh, about $1,300 to buy a, a, a fairly inexpensive but still powerful VR system and a PC to run it. Um, and I think it's really important here, we're not here to disparage VR at all. VR is absolutely wonderful. Um, in terms of the immersion that you can get with a VR system, it's unparalleled. Um, in terms of the practical training that you can get through virtual reality, you know, you can learn to tune up your car or a drilling rig before you accidentally break that multi-million dollar piece of equipment. Um, you can practice surgery ahead of actually doing so on a patient. Um, uh, and beyond that, it is hugely immersive. Uh, I'm sorry, it's hugely entertaining as well um, in regards to that immersion factor. Um, now, the biggest barriers to VR that we see right now are those top two bullet points. Uh, number one, it's pricey. Um, to get started, it's a little pricey. Um, and then number two, uh, VR systems do typically require um, you to carve out a small corner um, to run that VR station. Um, you do need a designated space that is stationary um, in order to run it. Um, now the perks of AR is, is you can sort of adapt it to the room or the space um, or what have you. Um, so it's fairly inexpensive. It's what's called casually accessible. So you can kind of just pick it up and go. There's not really setup required. It's as easy as sending a text or taking a photo. Um, and it is, again, fairly easy to integrate into what already exists. Um, and it, importantly here, uh, I really want to stress this is not a replacement for repository function. We're not saying cards are the future. Um, we're really saying that, that these, this sort of AR presentation or, or this means to disseminate uh, information could be a way to supplement repositories, especially with this 3D content. Um, and our intent really is to merge the two worlds, to merge traditional print media with web delivery itself. Um, and again, we see AR as one such way to easily make repositories publicly accessible. I think this is pretty fun. Um, so to give everyone a sample of what sort of companies, and I might get a little overexcited about this stuff, uh, <laughs> have, have already implemented AR. I wanted to show you guys a, a fairly diverse range of applications, folks that are not just doing AR cards, um, but uh, AR across the board. So I'm sure you guys recognize a couple of those folks. Um, our museum opted to do AR collectible cards um, that hopefully most of you have in front of you and are playing with. Um, so that's similarly being done by uh, Wizards of the Coast, which is up in the top left. If you guys are dorks like me, you know that those guys make Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> yeah. Um, and likewise, uh, Nintendo is doing collectible playing cards. Um, the New York Times and BBC News uh, have developed uh, augmented reality uh, front page displays. Um, easiest way to picture that is a, perhaps a newspaper out of Hogwarts with moving imagery on the front. Um, Cadbury has done AR packaging. Um, Ikea is doing some really fun stuff with an uh, augmented reality catalog where you can take the furniture you want to buy, stand in the room that you want to put that furniture in, and place it in real time to scale, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, from an educational point of view, uh, uh, institutions like the Kennedy Space Center are doing narration and video um, to supplement some of the aircraft and equipment with actual stories from the astronauts themselves. Um, and then, of course, Smithsonian is doing a number of things, um, most popular of which might be Skin and Bones, which is an app they've developed where you can go into their exhibits, look at a traditional skeleton, and then actually overlay it with musculature or skin or fur um, and, and learn a little bit more about the creature itself. Um, I mean, beyond this, the applications are boundless. We're talking, I've seen apps where you can scan your foot and try on a shoe before you go. Um, I've seen some really cool apps where uh, you can go to a hair stylist uh, and, and scan your hair and see what you'd look like with blonde or brown hair or blue hair. And it actually tracks your hair's movement in real time, which is crazy. So tons of applications across AR. Um, and so how did we land on printed cards? Um, instead of all of these other mediums. Um, and for us, collectible cards are really appealing for a number of reasons. Um, number one, case in point with the cards you guys have, you can touch them, you can interact with them, spin them around, zoom in and out. Uh, you control what to look at, um, the angle and the focus. Um, you can collect them, so you can take them home. You can revisit them whenever you want. Um, if you're like me, you can proudly hang them on your wall. Um, you can file them away uh, in card cases. Um, you can always return to the museum, too, to collect more. Um, 
And to that end, we can actually easily expand the number of cards we have. We have five demo cards today. Um, that's not to say we can't have 10 or 100. Um, it's really contingent on how fast we can scan um, and how fast we can design these cards, and that's really it. Um, and then finally, they're very easily distributed. We can download them, we can mail them or ship them. Um, like Chad said, Wyoming uh, has a lot of open space. We have 570,000 people. Um, in the so whole state. In the whole state. <laughs> um, and so that means there's a lot of open space and there's a lot of distance uh, learning communities and remote communities. Um, and so for these guys, a little bit difficult to visit the museum. And one of the wonderful things about AR cards is you can send them off. Um, they can even just print them at home or in their classroom um, and do any number of different activities and lesson plans around those. Um, so very briefly now, I wanted to touch on how I built this, this the, both the iOS and the Android app um, and speak a little bit about the, the major components necessary for others to follow suit. Um, first and foremost, knowing now that we wanted to build uh, these cards, our next goal was really to figure out uh, how to best disseminate the data in an easy to digest format. So there had to be a balance, right, between visual appeal um, and content delivery. Um, and an overarching goal here was really to ensure that the data shared in these cards was substantial and meaningful. Um, so to do so, we actually had a couple options. Option one, um, we could just subscribe to any number of AR hosting companies. There are companies out there that will host your 3D data uh, and you, all you do is upload the cards according to their designs um, and their, their bounds um, and then uh, uh, it's pretty much smooth sailing from there. Now the issue with a, a hosting site is that you give up a little bit of creative control. Um, so option two is really just to build everything from scratch. Uh, and we chose option two. Um, and so I want to add as a caveat here, I'm no programmer. Um, I'm really just a simple paleontologist uh, and STEM educator um, with a bit of a tech uh, and graphic design streak. Um, and, you know, I think it, most conveniently, I just happen to lack enough of a social life that I could watch YouTube videos. Um, and that's how I taught myself how to do this. Uh, and that's not to make fun of myself, that's really to, to drive home the point that anyone can make an app like this. It does not require um, uh, an intense background in programming or coding or app design to do so. Um, so there's two major components of the process to go from cards to AR content. Uh, first is a software development kit called Vuforia um, that allows you to host images um, like these guys um, as what are called target markers. And I'll talk about target markers in just a second for those who are unfamiliar with it. Um, and then the second half uh, of this is Unity. And I'll very briefly touch on, on Unity, um, which is uh, the, the software you use to build the app um, and align the target markers with the 3D content. So when I say target markers like this, uh, the easiest analogy here is really just a QR code. Right? Um, so in many of those paid or hosted app sites or uh, companies, one of the things they want you to do when they develop uh, or when you develop a card um, is to have a custom QR code that they've designed uh, placed prominently somewhere on the card. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that. I really wanted to preserve the aesthetic of the card itself. Um, and so I wanted the cards to serve as a unique fingerprint by themselves. Um, and so uh, that's actually that something that Vuforia will let you do. It lets you treat these guys as what are called target markers. Um, so you upload the cards you've designed to the Vuforia development portal, um, and it can identify unique aspects of the cards themselves. So um, if you see the Allosaurus card, um, the third image here is, is what it looks like when Vuforia sort of analyzes it um, and says, here are the unique points of that fingerprint. Um, so in such a way, the card itself sort of serves as a giant QR code. Um, so therefore, whenever you guys fire up the app that you've made in Unity, um, it will recognize each card from an internal database and then follow instructions to overlay content on top of that according to what you've programmed in Unity. Um, so there's no real need to take up valuable real estate with a QR code on the front or the back, um, which we think is fairly nice. Um, I won't dwell too much on Unity because um, 
talk for days about it, um, but Unity is, is a software used to develop, <coughs> develop app and games. Um, um, really, the, the biggest highlight of Unity here um, is how user-friendly it is, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here, but more than anything, time is really the limiting factor. If you guys have the ability to watch YouTube videos, you can learn how to do this stuff. Um, or if you have grad students, disposable grad students who can, who can watch this stuff too, um, that's an equally viable option. Um, but once you learn how to do this, it is fairly smooth sailing. Um, so one of the things um, I hope to do, and I'm not sure if this will work, um, is to highlight some of the cards we've designed. Um, and then I'll talk about card design in just a little bit. Um, but for those of you who have cards in front of you, you hopefully, if all goes well, the app is working and, and things are, are moving around for you. But one of the other cool things is that it does not require physical cards. So I'm not sure if the back of the room can do this, but you can just point your phone at the screen. Um, so these cards, it's not required by the size of the card. Um, you can scale these up to the size of a poster. It's, it's all contingent on how you design the cards and upload them as target markers. Um, so what we did um, was highlight a couple different animals from a couple, couple different time periods, everybody from mammoths here. Um, and you'll see that there's a couple others that are sort of faded out, if you can see those. Um, and the reason being, we're still uh, uh, focused on a challenge here of tracking multiple targets at once. So if you have two cards up at the same time, it has difficulty tracking, and it tends to just sort of pick up on the one um, that's most prominent. So uh, we had to sort of uh, make them transparent for the time being, but we have mammoths. We have what's called an Archaeotherium, which was a... Uh, this is our favorite one. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's a horse-sized, meat-eating, pig-like animal. <laughs> and its nickname truly was Terminator Pig or Devil Pig. Um, so they were pretty... I, I, I want to say they're scavengers, and I hope they were. Um, and then we even have things as small as little horn corals. So uh, you'd see those on the Devonian, They're the little corals that look like tiny little triangles that sit uh, on a tiny, tiny base. So um, our goals with the cards was really to make them as information rich as possible, but in a way that's still visually appealing. So to that end, there's quite a lot of content um, that visitors can pull from these cards. So most visually striking um, are the environmental scenes at the top of the card, um, which provide information on scientific name of the fossil, the specimen number for visitors to look up, um, and the common name of the animal. Um, uh, and then in addition, you can actually see there's an environmental scene where you can see the critter in its habitat with other flora and fauna to scale. Um, below that, we wanted to highlight temporal information. So show that guy in a geologic time scale, um, perhaps too with some iconic animals of the time to kind of give you a sense of when they lived. Um, there's also a quick, a quick blurb on the left um, with information on the critter. Um, on the right, there's information on weight. Uh, length and diet. Um, and then on the bottom right um, is some spatial information, um, a map of Wyoming that shows where the fossils in our collection were excavated. So there's a couple issues to overcome. We've designed the cards, we've uploaded them into Vuforia, we've started to upload our models, and one of the things we discovered um, is file size plays a fairly large issue. We don't want to give you guys an app that's uh, absolutely monstrous in size, but when you scan a fossil using Structured Light software, um, you're capturing data both on the, the surface color um, and the object itself. Um, and so what that means is you could often end up with uh, an app that's unwieldy and large. Um, so if I were to upload without doing anything to the simple five demo cards we did, we're looking at an app that's about 500 megs to a gigabyte. Um, show of hands, who would want to download that? Nobody. Um, so uh, essentially what we had to do is compress everything um, and make everything quite a bit smaller. So the easiest way to shrink the size of a file or the, the size of a 3D object um, is to reduce the number of polygons. And you can actually see here, hopefully, um, uh, a a saber-toothed skull um, that we've slowly reduced the number of polygons and it does get a little bit more, more like 90s video game-esque um, as you reduce the polygon count, um, but it does reduce the file size. Um, and so for us, a happy medium in terms of what we call decimating the object or reducing the number of polygons was about 6% the original size. So once you do that and then you wrap color around it again, um, you don't see too much of a difference in the object. There's a little bit when you zoom in and you might see that in the cards you're playing with. Um, but that actually led us to discover a second issue. Um, 
whenever you scan something, especially with the David scanner, um, it's going to spit out that color data, that surface texture, as a PNG uh, 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 texture file. Um, so we're looking at once we wrap that small 2.6 megabyte uh, uh, skull with the texture file, it's about 180 megabytes. Um, so again, that would add up for cards. So for us, we had to discover a way to uh, find a, a, a new way to, to wrap the texture around it um, and, and reduce that texture quality, well, texture without, without compromising the quality. Um, and so we tried for a while to compress the, the PND checksters, didn't have much success, and then we actually found out you can just upload a compressed JPEG. So we just uploaded things in Photoshop, saved them as a new file type, uh, and, and brought them into Unity. And, and the point there is to highlight, again, how user-friendly Unity is. Um, we've worked with a huge amount of file types, and Unity is whatever you throw at it, it seems like it can, it can handle. Um, for those of you who have who've played with this wiggling ichthyosaur card, um, that's a Cinema 4D file. For those of you who have played with the Mammoth, um, that's a raw Blender file. Um, Unity can handle Maya projects, OBJs, STLs, PNGs, JPEGs, you name it. So uh, it can handle a lot of different source material, which is great. And so the last thing I'll talk about before we start talking about applications here is a challenge that's ongoing. Even with the app as it stands, what we're talking about um, is for iOS users, an app that's about 130 megs for five cards, not great. Um, and then for Android users, about 55 megabytes. Um, and the reason being, all of the data, the 3D objects, the texture files, um, are all stored on the card. Or, or sorry, are stored in the app. Um, so what that means is if we did have 10 cards or 100 cards, um, it would add up pretty fast. Um, so we're exploring the idea of hosting things in a cloud server, which you can certainly do in Unity, um, and then call to them as needed. Um, and the pros here is that the only size of the app would be how many target markers. So it'd be like 10 JPEGs, which is pretty easy. Um, now the cons of that, um, the app right now does not requ require internet access, but for some folks, um, if we do pull from the cloud, um, that creates an issue where people wouldn't want to maybe use data or Wi-Fi to download five to 10 megabyte files at a pop, um, which we're still trying to find a, a balance for. And so lastly, before I turn it over to Chad, I wanted to talk about a couple other AR applications that you might see beyond AR cards. Um, so you can imagine, for one, um, AR might have a wonderful, wonderful application in terms of supplementing traditional, let's say, Victorian displays um, or minimalist displays, either for aesthetic reasons, uh, a display is, is minimalist, or um, because it is traditionally from a, a time period where not a lot of information was shared um, besides provenance. Um, uh, you can build out AR apps um, that would help supplement information in the exhibit without affecting the aesthetic or historical legacy of the exhibit itself. You can make dynamic museum displays that come to life with animation um, or appear as they did in antiquity with color or even repaired. Um, you can include AR content, including sound and video, in 3D printed kits. The visitors can rent or check out or buy um, Museum in a Box is one such company that does that. You can develop teaching kits um, and supplementary interactive ways to engage in content. So picture animated maps of Magellan's route um, just over the map in, in your classroom or collectible chemistry cards. Um, again, museum in a box on the top right. Um, these are particularly appealing for Wyoming where you have remote distance uh, or distance learning communities. Um, and then lastly, there's even an option for coffee table books, right? So you can picture a collections book that might highlight the most meaningful or impactful collections across your institution. It can stand alone with beautiful imagery um, and plenty of information, but it can also be supplemented with accompanying AR app um, that you know perhaps brings to life the historic pressed flower collection or pulls up digital models of famous artifacts, sculptures, um, and monuments. And I'll mm. turn it over to Chad here. Okay. Um, these last couple of slides, I just wanted to talk about other 3D applications that we're working on right now. Uh, Tyler was talking about uh, you know other hypothetical applications that you can you can certainly imagine that you could do with augmented reality, and I wanted to touch on a couple of other things that we're doing just to kind of hammer home that there are, there are so many really interesting things that you can do with this that aren't necessarily new. Um, 
most people in this audience know what stereo views are. Uh, so about a year ago, we got a small grant from the State Historic Records and Archives Board to digitize some stereo views from a local museum, the Laramie Plains Museum, as well as content that was in our own special collections. And a lot of this is from the turn of the century, so it's 150 years old. The stereo view down here on the bottom is from a Union Pacific collection. It's uh, the highest point on the Union Pacific, which is right outside of Laramie. Um, and you know, these were originally intended to be not necessarily 3D, but certainly two and a half D 150 years ago. And you just, you know, you held your little headset up to it. And basically what we're going to do with these is we've already scanned all this. And yeah, you can put this in a repository and people can look at it there, but it really wasn't, it wasn't meant to be experienced that way in the first place. So what we'd like to do is something really similar to what we've already done with this, take these, get these on a phone app so that you can, in this case, you would have to probably load it in a headset with try to, uh, stereo view goggles. Um, but you, know, you can get Google Cardboard or Mattel headsets for like 20 bucks. You don't have to buy a thousand dollar VR setup to get into something like this. And people don't have to come into your collection to use your handheld stereo viewer to do it either. Um, so that's one potential application that, that we're working on right now. Um, I also got a small grant through a humanities group on campus. Uh, this is a really fun project that uh, we've been working on with a couple of students in archaeology and anthropology. Um, these petroglyphs, so these were Native American rock art petroglyphs, uh, were literally blasted out of a face or a cliff face in northern Wyoming around Gray Bull, which is uh, east of Cody, Wyoming. And this was done back in the 60s, and this was a preservation thing that we used to do apparently and they were lost for 50 years so they found them in a Kwanzaa hut literally about two years ago so they came to UW people can't access these they're in this small um, storage room you can see how big these things are they're you know part of my other's duties as assigned is apparently moving 500 pound rocks now um, but we're you know we're reconstructing these so that we can put this cliff face back together so that the public can actually look at it again and put it back into the public into public access uh, mediums. So we're doing photogrammetry on it and we're doing uh, RTI imagery, which is reflectance transformation imagery. Um, I'm not gonna dig into that, but I think one of the, the coolest things about working with 3D is the connections we've been able to make with faculty across campus, as well as the students themselves. You know, doing the 2D stuff is great and we still do a lot of that, but when you walk in with these AR cards and put them in front of a faculty member and you see their little light bulbs going off, it's a really powerful sort of thing that we aren't necessarily able to do with our repositories, I think. Um, so this, is, this has been a great project. We were able to employ students, and pay them a decent wage to, to learn a new technology that's applicable across so many different fields. Um, it's just been a really rewarding experience. And this is one of our anthro students. Uh, they do most of the rock moving, which is great. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway. Um, a couple other anecdotes that I wanted to share just to get the people's ideas thinking. Uh, Tyler, Tyler's group, my group, and IT held something called a Tech Jumpstart session in the makerspace uh, near the end of last semester. It was kind of an open house where everybody that was doing some of this around campus came up and we were kind of peddling our wares. And at the time we just had prototypes of the AR cards. And we had this soil scientist walk in and she looked at this and said, oh my gosh, this would be so useful for my students, and I know nothing about soil science uh, whatsoever. I didn't know it even existed really, um, but apparently they go around the world and collect these soil samples, they bring them back to Laramie, they put them in a lab, sometimes they drop them, sometimes they just fall apart, they have to schedule the students to get access to the rooms, it's a pain in the butt. And basically uh, we started talking and we settled on, hey, you know, we have these open educational resource grants that we award through the libraries, maybe we can apply this to what you want to do with basically a supplemental lab notebook of um, these basically a lab notebook printed with images of the soil samples connected with the 3D models that we're going to make. And instead of having to go into the lab and do this at you know whatever hour that they can open it at, they can just do it on their phone while they're working in the lab themselves. So. This was a really cool thing that I would have never, ever imagined this would have gone there. Um, and then there's one last thing. Um, we have a really interesting historic clothing collection on campus. 
It's distributed in boxes that are unlabeled, everything's folded. Some of it's in special collections, some of it's in our archives, some of it's in some closet that I haven't seen. Um, and long story short, it's, it's the same set of problems that, that the last example was, where they can't get the students, they can't get these in the hands of the students to actually study them very easily. So we have all the 2D imagery of this in our repository, which is useful in terms of getting a, a little bit of an idea of what it was, but the faculty member wanted to see, wanted the students to be able to experience these in 2D or in 3D. So we're gonna put these things on mannequins and build models. And one of their um, textile students is gonna learn how to do photogrammetry, which is, a, again, a really um, great way to get students and faculty involved in something that, you know, even two years ago, we wouldn't have even thought about. Um, so with that, I, I want to leave some time for questions, but uh, again, this was it, a, a very collaborative project. It's been personally and professionally rewarding. Tyler's an awesome person to work with. He was Thanks, one man. of our students. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see the progression of, you know, where this can take a student, I think, over time, which is, I think, a, a, a really cool thing to watch. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop blabbing and let, let you guys ask us questions. <clears throat>